Yeah, I think uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today. And uh, it looks like we've got 60 people in the lab now, so that's great. Uh, they're live on video, but also in the slides. Is, I hate uh, that picture. <laughs> it's from Wikipedia. <laughs> it's Robert Scoble. I hate it. <laughs> well, here we have the one and only Jeff Jarvis. He's asked me to keep his introduction really short, uh, which I wish I could do, but unfortunately I'm a big fan, so I'll keep it as short as I can. Uh, Wikipedia calls Jeff Jarvis an American journalist. I have no idea what that means. Maybe you can uh, expand on that when I finish introducing you. Uh, a few years ago, Jeff wrote a really incredible book called What Would Google Do? Highly recommend it. One of the best books I've read in recent years. In the book, he discusses how companies can become successful like Google. So really about how business models as we know them on the internet are completely changing. Uh, and I can't recommend it enough. It's really quite excellent and a good, good read. Uh, Jeff is currently the Associate Professor and Director of the Interactive Journalism Program at the, uh, and New Business Models for News Project uh, at the City University of New York's Graduate School of Journalism. He's also a consulting uh, editor and partner at Daylife, which is a new startup, and it's actually a very interesting new startup. They've done some um, very interesting kind of API challenges and hack days in the past that you should check out. Um, he also writes a column for The Guardian and is a host of their Media Talk USA podcast, which uh, I've listened to and is quite excellent. Um, he's a consultant for many, many media companies, and before that, uh, was the creative director of Advanced.net, an online, online arm of advanced publications. And obviously, Jeff, for many, many years, has been a critic, a journalist uh, at, at many different publications, including the San Francisco Examiner, uh, Chicago Tribune, and Chicago Today. And he blogs about media and news at buzzmachine.com. So there we have it. Over to you, Jeff Jarvis. Thanks again for joining us today. Really happy to have you here. Well, thank you so much. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and uh, or not here, or kind of here. And uh, it's build a lecture, but I'd like to uh, look at this differently. And uh, I want to use you to try out some material, uh, like a comedy show, on some stuff that I'm working on now. Um, I, uh, I, I, as I think you said in that way too long introduction, I now head the Center for the Tao Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at CUNY, and I'm going to try to work on kind of a, um, I don't know, treatise, white paper, uh, something or other. And, I, and I, in there, I want to throw in a lot of ideas. So what I thought I'd do today is just throw those ideas out to you and get your reaction to them. Um, so it's, it's, it's a laundry list. It's a catalog, and, and it's a little less, disjoint, less jointed. And there are no PowerPoint slides. It's too early for that. You're welcome. I expect to hear virtual applause for no PowerPoint. Uh, so among the ideas I want to throw out, the first one that, that I uh, throw out a lot, some say too much, is the notion that we are now in a link economy versus an ink economy. A um, little too cute way to say it, but the notion that I don't think folks understand in a content business is they think the entire value they have, and this is true in the news business, is their content. And they think that's the only value creation. And they don't understand the value of the links to them, the creation of an audience. There are now two creations of value, the creation of the content and the creation of the public for it. Uh, so when Rupert Murdoch says that Google is sending him worthless readers, that's a terrible insult to all those readers. And what it really says is that he doesn't know how to find value in those relationships. And so I think we have to look at that as a fundamental underpinning of where we go here. I'm about to start a research project at CUNY to look at how to optimize the link economy, to first look at how you can send more links, and what's the optimal way to do that, is it length, kind of link, and so on. And then also when one receives a link, uh, how do you optimize the value that you can recognize from that? And that's kind of the obvious first stage here. But the next question I'll ask is whether perhaps we're still looking at content in the old way by making readers come to the content. Online, obviously, the content should come to the readers. And what does that mean about the structure of media? You know, I, I, I worked on, pardon me, here's a plug, the first of many, another book called Public Parts, uh, coming out September 26th in the US. And I did, to my surprise, in looking at the tools of publicness, uh, a fair amount of research on Gutenberg. And one of the 
lovely little thoughts that came out in that was that before the press, scholars had to go town to town to go to the books. Well, then suddenly the books would come to them. And what did that explode? So I think that this notion that we have that readers must come to the site, which is reinforced by Comscore measurement and the need to uh, try to maximize the audience you have at your site. Well, that's wrong. Why shouldn't content be completely embeddable and spreadable like peanut butter uh, or like YouTube videos? And content should be able to go anywhere. So if you look at that kind of economy, what I envision is that perhaps there's a new marketplace to exchange value. So right now, the New York Times gets mad at the Huffington Post when it uh, links to the New York Times taking, in their view, too much of the substance of an article. Well, first thing I want to study is maybe that substance of the article is a better link. Let's get to some numbers on that. But if there is so much interest in New York Times content at the Huffington Post, as there surely is with the audience there, then ideally the New York Times should perhaps put its content at the Huffington Post with New York Times monetization and branding and links um, and analytics. And there should be a marketplace that enables that kind of exchange so the New York Times can go to the readers rather than making the readers go to the New York Times. So as we look at what that means, I think it also makes us say, where is the real value in this relationship? I wrote a bit of a treatise on this topic. And in there, I quote a major media executive I had lunch with who said that, uh, that media companies' content is the steel that the likes of Google use to make their cars. And that assumes, again, that all the value is in the content. And he kind of made fun of Facebook and, and Mark Zuckerberg and saying that they don't value their content in media companies. And I said it's actually the opposite, that Zuckerberg and Google value more content than content companies do. Content companies think that content is that which they make because they are content companies. Facebook uh, values the content that we all put out there. Twitter does as well. Certainly Google does as well. And part of the reason they do that, part of the reason Facebook does that, is because it obviously recognizes value in other ways. The war that is occurring now in the business of online, I think, is not around content or even audience. It's around the signal generation. Who is, the, who is better at getting us to generate signals about ourselves, signals that enable these companies to target their content services and advertising to us, signals that include, obviously, who we are, what we like, what we do, what we search for, what we buy, also now, very importantly, with mobile, where we are. And all those signals are very valuable. So the end of this string is that I wonder whether there is greater value in the content or in the relationships that it helps enhance. That content is merely a tool toward a new and more fundamental business model, which is based on relationships. Now, that is counterintuitive and heretical to my business. That uh, The belief is that we make content, content has value, people should pay us for that, though I've never seen a business model built on the word should. And so to turn around and know content's just a tool, a magnet, a, 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 a fringe benefit, uh, well, that doesn't make me very popular. But I think that that's something worth looking at. So the notion of the link economy. Uh, another notion that I want to throw out, I should have thrown out first, is I think that an important thing for you all to look at is not only the technology future of this world, but also, very importantly, the business future. Uh, I teach entrepreneurial journalism because it is important to me to have uh, journalists learn the business of journalism so they can make it sustainable. When I came up through the business, when I came through journalism school, I was told to stay away from business. It was corrupting. And well. What that meant was that we journalists became very poor stewards of journalism. We didn't do well to maintain journalism and to help it advance into the future and to think it through. I would say the same to you as technologists. Uh, and I know there are many stripes that you all have on you, but, but I, many of you are technologists. And we need more of that. And God bless you, everyone. But we also need you to think through the business of journalism as well. 
Uh, my friend Nick Denton once said when I was on the board of his last company, moreover, he, he said one day, I can't afford brainstorming anymore. We can have lots of neat ideas, lots of wonderful things, but if we haven't figured out how to make it sustainable, profitable, then it won't survive. And that is the greatest challenge we have, I think, today in news. Uh, now, having said that, I think part of what I see in many of your projects is rethinking the form of news, the form of journalism. And I think that's a very important project. Um, I wrote a piece a while ago in which it kind of just kind of hit me that the article is no longer the atomic unit of news. Meg Horahan, who was one of the co-founders of Pyra, which made Blogger, you all know, I'm sure, uh, wrote a great blog post in 2003 arguing that the atomic unit of content was no longer uh, the publication or the section or the page or even the story, that the new atomic unit was the post because this was the blogging era. And what it really said was the atomic unit of media is the idea or the meme or the tchotchka, call it what you will. Well, I, I think we see that happening, obviously, in news today, where you see the, the Guardian doing amazing live blogging of the hacking scandal or of other things. Certainly there, there maybe isn't an article. The example that I, I like to give is Andy Carvin. I'm sure you all know Andy, A-C-A-R-V-I-N. If you don't follow him now, he has done a brilliant job of tweeting and retweeting the Arab Spring. And we're doing research at CUNY now uh, thanks to Twitter, we will hope to get his data and start to visualize the nodes and networks he creates. Andy knew some people in Egypt, so when that started, he went to the people he knew and he said, you know, who else do you know? And the creation of nodes and networks was a key value there. But it struck me that as Andy tweets, uh, in, in, in the height of Tahrir Square, Andy tweeted and retweeted 1,300 times in 21 hours, I think it was. At the end of that, there was never an article. There was no article. It was a process. Now, that's not to say that articles don't have value. They do. There is a place for articles in this, pro in this idea. But, but the article is no longer the only form of news, the requirement of news, the necessity of news. The article was a necessity of the means of production and distribution of old media, of print media and of shows as well. So if you rethink forms utterly, we have to break out of this notion that we write articles, and that's what news has to be. And people who can do that are news people. Well, not at all. So many of you are looking at ways that people get obviously far more collaborative than this and contribute all kinds of other and new elements to news. And I encourage that and applaud that. The more we rethink the form of news itself, the more important that is. The more we realize that news is properly seen as a process, not a product. Again, the only reason it was turned into a product, it was productized, was because we had to, to put out a paper once a day or a show once a day. But news never begins and never ends. It continues in, 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 can, without stop and without beginning, so it is properly seen as a process. Now, at some point in that process, you may want to pluck out what you know right now and write an article. Then again, Wikipedia is an incredible vehicle for giving you a snapshot of what the world knows now. Uh, Twitter is a new way, of course, to bring together various ideas and, and witnesses' knowledge. So I think that, that notion of form and changing and the end of the article is another idea I want to throw out. Related to that, is that I see, the other thing that Andy Carvin teaches me in this and in, in Twitter during the Arab Spring and other such stories teach me is and here I want to I want to borrow Larry Lessig who has been speaking lately uh, about how we have to look at controlling some of the things we want to control in light of the architecture of the internet and and realize what the architecture of the internet dictates. Well, I'm seeing that through the Arab Spring and Twitter. I think that I'm seeing news beginning to mimic the architecture of the internet, that is to say, end to end, witness to world. And what Andy did was he didn't start, he didn't say, hey, people in Egypt, tweet this. He didn't crowdsource this. No one told those people to do it. He couldn't start anything. They're, they were doing what they were doing because they were telling the world what they were seeing. 
and there was incredible value in that. Now Andy kind of stood above it like a puppet master, right? and, he, and he looked down and he plucked out the good people, and he plucked out the good content. And then he added value to this. He asked people questions. He debunked rumors. He gave context. He gave caveats. He, he gave links. He asked people to translate things. There was all kinds of journalistic value that Andy added to a process that was happening without him. It didn't need him anymore. There was no need for a central hub, a gatekeeper, a publisher, a broadcaster. It was end-to-end, witness-to-world. And I think that's an important way to look at this. And as you as technologists and tech-savvy people, the more that you build upon not the assumptions of the old world, but the assumptions of the new world, the better off you and we are all going to be. So don't try to recreate what existed before. And in many of your projects, I see you're not doing that. And, and again, I think that's great. But that's the reflex of people in my business, is how do we recreate the form of news? How do we recreate the business models of news? In my Gutenberg research, there's a wonderful book by Elizabeth Eisenstein, who was really the, the definitive work on the birth of printing and Gutenberg. And she points out that the book in its earliest years just mimicked scribal form. Right? The earliest fonts were efforts to mimic the handwriting of the scribe. Printing was originally called automatic handwriting. It took 50 years before publishers began to break out and realize that the book was a new form and treat it that way. It took 100 years before the book really showed its impact on society. And so I would argue that today we're about in the year 1467, about 17 years after the creation of the commercial web. So we don't know what this thing is yet. We have no idea yet. We have to rethink that utterly. So part of that, I, I believe, another, another notion here is that I want news people to look at news as a platform rather than a product. And I would ask you to tell me what you think that means. What, what is news as a platform? If it's a product, then it's something that we hand out one way to people. And, and even to this date, we're still acting as if we're recreating scribal fonts by putting articles online. And yes, now we allow people to comment on what we do. But if it's truly a platform, if we really rethink what a platform is, then we would operate differently. We would enable people, Google-like, to communicate on their own at a marginal cost of zero, because that's what the internet enables. And then we would say, well, what is not happening there? How can we add journalistic value to that? How can we add other value to that? I, I teach courses in entrepreneurial journalism, and one of my students has a project that's going to enable people, and I don't want to give away our idea, but enable people to get together uh, for um, dinners. I'll we'll just say that. And people say to me, well, how's that journalism? Well, I define journalism very, very broadly. Too broadly, some would say. I say that journalism uh, enables communities to organize their information so they can organize themselves. And if you started a newspaper, a news organization today, and said, how do we serve a community? How do we serve a community, for example, of foodies? Would you start a food section with content in it? No. You'd start a platform that enables people to do what they want to do. We have platforms that enable them to share recipes. They also would want to get together. They'd also want to discuss things. They'd want to do things. So how is news a platform rather than a product? In the last uh, week or so, I've caused a bit of a kerfuffle online by accident. It was, it, was the, it was the wine talking when I got pissed off about what was happening in Washington. And I um, came to my computer and did what one does on Twitter, which is unload one's chest. And I said, damn it, it's our economy and it's our money. Fuck you, Washington. And uh, I, I saw some response, and so I chuckled to myself and said, oh, let's start a chant here with that. And someone, of course, properly came in and said, you idiot. No, it's a hashtag. So I started the hashtag. And last I looked yesterday, I think that there were 104,000 uses of the hashtag, fuck you, Washington. By the way, you won't see that in the trending topics on Twitter. Twitter now says that they censor offensiveness, but only some offensive, offensiveness, not others. What I realized about that was, it, it, as anything does these days, it teaches me a media lesson, that the hashtag itself is a form of media. The hashtag 
once it moves past just Twitter being held in proprietary space. And I encourage Google Plus to support the hashtag. And of course, we have tags on blogs and tags on photos. The tag becomes a new media space that cuts across silos, that enables people to gather around ideas and actions and topics and opinions. And I think that's a very powerful notion. But again, it breaks out of the idea that news is content, that media is content. And, and it teaches me that even a hashtag is a platform. It's an open platform that enables people to do things. Now, people got mad at me when I didn't say F-U-G-O-P or Tea Party or so on. But what was interesting about this was that people filled in their own reasons. Fuck you, Washington, for making my parents nervous about paying their bills next month, for not letting me marry who I want, for not being able to collaborate and, and, and uh, like a three-year-old could. So the notion of a platform, of course, is always that it enables people to take it over and do what you could not imagine could be done with it. Now, I always say that if Microsoft had created Craigslist or Wikipedia, it would have come with a manual this big and terms of service and a little talking paperclip explaining how to use it. Craig Newmark knew he won, I think, when people took over Craigslist and did with it what they wanted to do. And that is always the success of a platform is that you open it up, you have the respect for the users, that they know what they want to do, and they do amazing things. So thus, you also see that, that data is a great platform. Texas Tribune is doing great things. Some of your projects are around data. And I think that that enables people to find the news that they need to find and changes the structure and form of news greatly. I think that um, all of these go to enabling a new relationship with news and the public. Uh, I've already talked about Andy as the puppet master. Or, but actually, that's the wrong vision because he's not pulling any strings. The world's going on without him. But, but, but he's looking down and, and, and curating and pulling things out. Um, I, I think one of the key ideas for the future of journalism is collaboration. And I see that in many of your projects, whether that's just being able to hand in stuff that you've seen as a witness or other means. And this goes to the economic basis of news. If we think that news organizations have to do all the news themselves, then we'll never get anywhere. We can't afford that. What we have to do is, once again, enable the world to do what it wants to do at a marginal cost of zero, and then figure out what we do on top of that. And what we should do often is enable collaboration, is enable people to do things together, is to become a community organizer that helps organize communities to do what they want to do and help them do it better. So one of the hallmarks of what I want to see going forward in, um, in the notions of the future of journalism is the idea of collaboration. And that leads to another key challenge that we have in news is engagement. When we did some research at CUNY on new business models for news, kind of looking at a market the size of Boston and seeing what happens if the newspaper there died, because at the time it looked probable that the globe could die, we then looked and realized that there was an ecosystem of news that was already emerging. It's not as if one big old organization is going to get replaced by one big new organization. There are many, many players operating there. And we looked at a lot of the ways to try to optimize that value through the creation and, and or the support of networks. I'm working on a project now in New Jersey to try to do that. But key thing we found in that research was that we just picked out the standard page views per user per month from the industry, and it was about 12 page views per user per month. Facebook gets that every day. If we think in news that we have engagement with the public, we're full of crap. We don't. People come to us occasionally for stuff. That's pretty much it. We allow them to comment on what we've done. And I've seen one of your projects is to try to improve the civility of that. I think that's a laudable thing to do. But I realized in, in this discussion that the notion and the, and the architecture of comments is essentially insulting to the public. It says, we don't want to hear from you until after we're done. And once we're done, we will allow you to comment. And by the way, we don't really care what you say, so we're going to go to the bar and be gone while you're commenting. And when we come back and see that you've trashed the place, we'll just make fun of you and say, see, this is what happens when you listen to the public. What I realize is that in collaboration and engagement, 
we really mean that. It means involving pe people up the chain, much, much earlier in the chain. And when you do that, when we truly collaborate, then it's a more productive uh, relationship. We do things together. It's a relationship of respect. It's not just about commenting on what we've done. And if we truly want engagement in news and engagement in our communities, then that is what we have to do. Collaboration is the highest form of engagement. Now, I'm not saying that everyone has to collaborate and everyone has to do tasks. You know, we have Clay Shirky's 1% rule for Wikipedia. 1% of the people who make Wikipedia, who use Wikipedia, make it. So that's true probably in news and communities as well. It's probably a small number, but that's true engagement. That is respecting the public. That's where we have to go in news. Also, the audience becomes, uh, and I, I, I use the word audience guardedly here. It's Jay Rosen who says the people are formerly known as the audience. But the public become the distributors. This goes back to the notion at the beginning about the link economy. And I've mapped out, I know I've got about three minutes left, I've mapped out um, the notion of spheres of discovery. That in media, we had to go to media. We had to go to them. We had to buy the paper, watch the show on their schedule. That's the way it worked. Google, of course, changed the relationship. It started not with media, but with the consumer, the audience, the public. We ask a question. Are you there with an answer? You exist. If you're not there with an answer, you don't exist. But then came links, and links become far more important. Uh, I forget the latest numbers, but last I know, uh, Eric Schmidt's been saying for quite some time that Google sends a billion clicks a month to publishers through Google News, an additional three billion clicks a month uh, through Google as a whole for four billion total every month. Uh, this spring, Bitly passed eight billion clicks a month. Now, that's not chickens to chickens, eggs to eggs, because uh, apples to apples, sorry. Um, because a lot of those clicks obviously go to flaming cat videos on YouTube. But it shows the Don Henry power of the people through links. And the audience becomes the distributor. And so if you don't set up what you do to enable the public to distribute and spread what you do, then you're lost. And that's why, Mr. Murdoch, you're full of crap in London, because going from millions of readers to 100,000 paying readers at the Times of London just cuts out your connection with the world. The Guardian, where, where I write sometimes, uh, views this far more openly. Um, finally, in uh, my book, second plug, Public Parts, out September 27th in the US, uh, I, I come around to the end uh, looking at, it's not about privacy, though I deal with privacy a great deal, uh, because I want to talk about publicness. And it's not an either or. It's not binary. It's more like hot and cold or wet and dry. It's a gradual thing. One depends upon the other. So I work hard to try to define and find definitions of privacy. But the point is to balance that as we go maniacal these days about privacy, privacy, privacy. We also have to look at the value of publicness. And the internet gives us this incredible tool of publicness. And so I look at sharing and how I've shared everything, including my prostate cancer online. And I look at how we all share and how we ought to operate more openly in companies and governments and how the internet enables that. But at the end, and here's my final point, I come to a defense, the need for a defense of the tools of publicness. And really what you are all working on, every one of you, is finding tools of publicness, tools that enable the public to speak, to find each other, to act, to learn, to lobby, to take transactions, to do whatever the public wants to do. We all have the Gutenberg Press in our pockets. And at the end of the book, I come around, and I've written about this in my blog a lot, that we have to have a discussion about the principles of publicness, and that we have to protect publicness, and not allow this to be taken over by governments or companies. And I'm not anti-company. I wrote a fanboy book about Google. But it's up to us on the internet. It's up to you as technologists to not only exercise the tools themselves, but to protect those tools, to protect this publicness that we are now granted by the internet. And so what excites me about what you all are doing is that you're doing just that. You are exercising those muscles. You're doing these amazing things. And so my only advice to you is don't listen to people who have, well, you can listen to people who have hair my color, but don't listen to the past. Reimagine the future. 
we think where this goes. Don't assume that news has to be content, that it has to be articles, that it has to come from a source, that it has to come from journalists. Assume that news is what a community knows, and how do you draw that out and enable a community to do that better? The more you do of that, the happier I'll be. So with that, I'm looking forward to discussion.